So for this week, we're basically going to interview Jason about the origins of GORUCK, some of the history, you know, what the company's been up to over the last almost 10 years now, which is a little hard to believe if you go all the way back. Yes. And uh, I guess sort of the, the impetus for this was I was tooling around on our website last week or sometime, just kind of going through things and checking things out, and I was looking at the About page. So GORUCK.com slash About. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff on there. And I knew all that stuff. You and I had talked about it. I'd read the page before, but it had been a while. And so I was just like blown away reading it. It took me, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to go through all of it. And I was like, this is great stuff. I'd forgotten some of it. And so uh, I started talking with you a little bit about it. And we thought, man, this is, <laughs> this is good. So we should, we should share some of this with the, the greater go community and with the folks that are, that are listening out there because like any good business, it's got a great, it's got a better story behind it. And um, we asked folks out in the GORUCK community over the course of the week to send in some questions and uh, that they wanted to hear from you about. And some of them are pretty good. I wrote some of those down here, so we'll get to some of those questions. We appreciate it. And then throughout the course of this, if you guys have questions, if anything we talk about kind of brings up a question, just uh, send them in and at the midway point or somewhere along the way. Free advice, whatever it might be, yeah, whatever. right? You get what you pay for, but uh, we'll, we'll do what we can. <laughs> Bomber will feed those to us as, as <laughs> usual from off camera. We gotta get Bomber on camera at one of these. At yeah. One of these. But uh, yeah, and we'll go through those too. So should be fun. Start firing away with the questions whenever you guys are ready. Um, I've got a few preloaded here and uh, we can go ahead and get started. You ready? Ready. Pretty All nervous, right. gotta talk about GORUCK, but ah, better than that. It'll be hard for you. Okay, so the first one I've got written down here, and I think it's actually kind of a good one, is when you started GORUCK, did you have a vision for it to be big and kind of life-changing for people as it is now? By the way, this came from uh, Nicolina Converso. I think I said that right. So Nicolina, thank you for the question. Nico, what's up? And um, so I like this question because I, I think it's interesting to ask you this because you could frame it as, did you, could you ever have imagined it would be what it is today, which it's pretty awesome. I suspect, I suspect you probably did, and if I were to ask you now, maybe even bigger, but that's my, that's my guess. What, uh, how would you answer the question? So there's sort of two answers. The first was that in December of 2007, when there was this idea to, to make a, a go bag, if you will, for Emily, who was serving in West Africa in, in the embassy there, that it was going to be a hobby. So I was going to move to West Africa. Life was going to be perfect, you know. Skip to the end of five years of marriage and, you know, it's like it's still going to be perfect because you lie to yourself and you tell yourself these things, right? The bad decisions that you make, they, they do, actually, you do actually pay for them in, in the end. But so it was like, okay, I've got this idea to build a go bag. And I did it for Emily and a couple of other people at the, at the embassy. And I thought that in the year, year and a half that I was going to end up living there, that it would be sort of a side thing that I could do to put my background to good use before I moved back and, and joined her at Department of State in, in Washington. So GORUCK as it first was born was not really meant to be anything like what GORUCK is now, except that it very much leveraged the only thing I knew, which was my background in Special Forces. You know, there was no business plan really, there was no kind of all those things that you should have. There were no budgets or anything like that. Oh, the budget. <laughs> right? And so, you know, that part of that, part of where my head was then was that I still wanted to con continue to serve America. And GORUCK I viewed as an impediment to that for a period of years. So I came back, crash and burn, life got pretty messy, and, you know, marriage is disintegrating, and... You know, I'm like a bad country song, a guy and his dog, right? And that's which you were lucky to have, by the yeah, way. Yeah, right? which I was lucky to have. Emily graciously gave me, gave me Java, said that I needed him even more than she did. I, so. didn't, I didn't get the Labrador in my divorce, <laughs> and you did, so don't take it for granted. I know you don't. I don't, because, yeah, that dog. But came back and, you know, still had this sort of hobby for Go Rock and thought it was a really good idea and liked the name. And eventually I needed to start cataloging expenses against it, which is kind of a weird thing. So I went to LegalZoom. I was sitting in a hotel in Colorado Springs and my stepdad, Mike, was in town. I remember filling out the paperwork in, in the Antlers Hilton in Colorado Springs because I was at station at Fort Carson. And so 
did all that and got the paperwork and then I had this legal structure. And it, it was still kind of a, a shell for this hobby that I was doing that was gonna prepare me to, to spend a little bit of time in West Africa. Anyway, you fast forward to, back to America and I'm trying, to, trying to figure out what to do with my life and then you know, applied for the post 9-11 GI Bill. So I guess my point is, is that it wasn't just, hey, I'm all in, I really love this. It took a long time. I don't know anything about sewing or manufacturing. I don't know anything about certainly you know, what became the GORUCK Challenge. I mean, that was kind of an offshoot. And, and so, and I definitely was not willing to put my name out there because I wanted to serve America. And if you want to go back to the government, you know, having any type of notoriety for being in business is not necessarily a good path to be in. Not necessarily, right? So yeah. I, didn't want to, I didn't want to compromise or sacrifice that path that I wanted to go down for yeah. something being in the realm of business, which right when you get out of the military or special forces, it's not really that cool to make money being a special forces guy talking about your past in special forces. It's not cool, right? Yeah. And in fact, it's really frowned upon. And so- I like hid my, my stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, my neighbors didn't even know. I set, up a, I set up a pseudo Facebook account to launch the GoRuck account. To, to talk about. Do you remember the name? Can we, is it still like. It's still yeah, on? I'm not going to say it, but I, <laughs> I do remember the name. Sorry, guys, I tried. <laughs> and, and so I, I guess all throughout the. I, I say all that to say this that eventually I ended up at business school and I was kind of faced with this fork of. GORUCK kept asking for more money, needed more money, design, develop, R&D, eventually start manufacturing stuff. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars. You, you, yeah. I didn't have that. I had a little bit of money from my deployments and then M and I, when we split, it was, you know, 50-50, right? And so I actually got the better end of that, that bargain. She made, she made better money as a diplomat in West Africa than I did in the Army. You took her for a ride. The the I took her for a ride, you know, <laughs> like I, I got the dog and, and the, better, the better half. So, um, well done. But I, I started incubating GORUCK at business school and got people involved helping to build it, but I still wasn't willing to kind of throw myself out there. Anyway, to answer Nico's question more directly is that I didn't have a vision for what this was at all in the very early stages, but once I was all in, and that would come a little bit later after GR1, sort of around the time of the challenge, once I was all in, I mean, I think GORUCK can be a hugely, like, I think it can be a huge American success story in line with some of the biggest brands that exist out there. So once the vision for actually what has, is now GORUCK was more cemented, then, yeah, I mean, I think we're at a fraction of where we're going. Long answer to a short question. No, that's, a good, that's a good answer. <laughs> so I was going to ask you, at, at what point did, it, did you say this is going to be big or can be, can be big? Because I know we, you and I have talked enough over the last several years that you, know, you, don't even, you don't consider this to be big. Like what we're doing at GORUCK now, while we're, we're thankful and we're happy to be here and we're enjoying it, we're certainly not sort of settling and... and Putting yeah. it on cruise control. I'm grateful for the people, you know, the people that I've met that are our core and our foundation. And, and so that's been in this, let's call it the first decade of GORUCK, mm -hmm. that's been the most important part to me. And, and in that, I'll include the people from my past and, and your past and our community and special forces is sort of, you know, in the early days, there was a couple guys from my, from my old team, specifically a guy named Josh. And you know, I chatted with him, call it 2010, and kind of was asking for his blessing a little bit. You know, because mm -hmm. he's one of those super skeptical special forces guys that, like, he, if you can pass his litmus test. Every Navy SEAL movie is like, that's some bullshit. <laughs> yes, exactly like that. Sorry, Navy SEALs, we love you guys. <laughs> and so, you know, he just said, look, you seem like this is, this seems like a good thing, you know? Like you're, you're building great gear in America, you're telling a story the right way, and then slowly the, the challenge came to fruition. And that was another way to, to give back from our, our past. And that's, that's how I viewed it, and I hope that's how it came across. And so when the challenge started to catch on, the first challenge was September 25th, 2010. And once that started to sort of catch, catch on, in fact, class one caught on to, to me in my heart. It's like, this is it. This is how we're gonna build GORUCK. And so from that point in, I, I can't say I was 100% in yet, but I was definitely really, really close to that. So that was, that was 
let's see, the second year of business school for me. Yeah. Good. So there were, there were actually several questions from people about your experience at business school. I, I was actually sort of surprised that so many people cared about your time at, at Georgetown <laughs> Business School, but... I get a lot of these questions about business school. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and ask one. I mean, what, what about the experience at business school do you think helped you uh, along the way, or, or do you think it did help you? Maybe just in general, how was your experience at business school as someone fresh out of the Army, fresh out of you know, deployments and things like that? Mm -hmm. Now you're in this sort of pristine setting in Georgetown, um, and you've got the time and the space and the opportunity to think about things. How did that... Uh, play into this? So there's a lot that we hear about in the media about the transition of veterans to the civilian world. And my take is, is that from personal experience, they're all true and, and then some. So for me, it was no real difference. I mean, it's, it's not like when one thing goes wrong, usually lots of things start to go wrong. In, it's in your life or whatever. And so losing the identity, the support structure, the financial base, the mission, all, all of those things that were attached to the essence of who I was being a special forces guy, you know, it all came crumbling down at the same time. You know, marriage, no, no wife, no, no job, no purpose, no nothing. You right? used to be somebody? I used to be someone who was really cool. You yeah. know, I could really hold my head high and know that I was doing great things for America and the guys to my left and right, and it was, it was an awesome profession. So getting out, it was, it was difficult, mostly because it's, it's, you're just kind of naked to the world. And you gotta and find- nobody, by the way. Yeah, you're nobody now, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a million SF guys eventually, right? I mean, they're, they're out there and you know, you've gotta make your, you gotta start over again from, it's like you gotta go back to basic training almost, except it's, it's the real world. Mm -hmm. And so the, the post 9-11 GI Bill, I'm grateful to the American taxpayer for, for funding that. It's, it's, an, Thank you. it's an awesome, awesome gift that we've earned, right, as, as veterans. But more than just the direct skills that I learned, I'll get to in a second, was the, the time that it bought me. So it bought me time to sort of figure out my way. And the, the first year of business school was both challenging and kind of easy. And, and the easy part was a lot of people were getting stressed out about the workload and, you know, and I was, I was an average business school student and I was spending a lot of time doing other stuff and my mind was not completely in it to win it like it was, say, in undergrad, you know, but I was a pretty average business school student. But I, I knew how to work on a small team and kind of divide and conquer and provide some, hey, this is how we're going to attack these problems that we're, are team is working on, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, and so that was, that, was the, that was the easy part. The hard part was I just kind of didn't know if this is what I wanted to be doing with my life. And so that's a bigger, much deeper issue when you're at a place and you think, should I even be here doing this at all? Like I should be off in some third world country doing what, whatever, wherever America needs me to be doing that. And that that felt in my heart like that's what I should be doing. Did your team deploy, your old team, did they deploy shortly after you yeah. got out? Yeah, they deployed yeah, right after. And so yeah. that was just, you know, and I heard some of the stories and, you know, it was just tough to not be there. They, you know, nobody got, nobody got uh, killed or anything on that deployment, but it was a little rougher deployment than the one that my team had just been on. And we were tight, you know, we had all been on, the deployment to Iraq in 2007, then we went to Africa and Europe in 2008, and then 2009, they're going back to, to, to Iraq, sorry. And like all of a sudden, that's, that's the only place I wanted to be. And I found myself in Washington, D.C., you know, our nation's capital, and I guess not coincidentally, the first event that I ever planned, I think in my entire life, I called it War Stories and Free Beer at Georgetown. And the reason why I did that was because people would ask me questions about my time in, in the service that just indicated that they didn't really understand what it meant to serve or what you know the details of that. What's the difference between special forces and the Marines? You know, stuff like that. The stuff like that that, by the way, I would have asked before serving. So I could really relate to it. And I, I, I wanted to be able to give back as in, in terms of a knowledge base. It's, 
tangible knowledge to these classmates of mine. And so I felt that that was an important way to start to build build the bridge between the military and the civilian worlds within the, the community of students. So the first year was a little bit rough. I, you know, from the standpoint of I, I didn't really want to be there. I didn't really understand what I was going to get out of it. And even for the next, for the full two years, you know, I started incubating GORUCK and everything kind of applied to GORUCK for me. So that was a really nice outlet, if you will. But it's some real world application of the, the stuff you were learning in the classroom. It, it was. The, the sort of problem with that, though, was that business school teaches you more strategy. It teaches you how to be a manager. It teaches you how to be a, you know, like, oh, you want to be a, a banker at Goldman Sachs and manage a team, and you need to be able to review their financial statements and whatever that type of stuff. And that's all good and well, but uh, you know, GORUCK was built from the ground up. Right? Here's my legal Zoom GORUCK LLC documents, right? To where do you find the money to, to, to designing GR1, to where do you find the money to sort of scale it, to all these things. And there, there were some pretty significant gaps that I found tactically from what I learned in business school to what I needed in those first several years of GORUCK. And yet I found that over time, the lessons of, of Georgetown's business school, and by the way, the administration, the students, the teachers, they were fantastic to me. I mean, they were hugely supportive. I'm still in touch with a lot of them. And it was, a, it, was, it was an experience and a great one at that that has really aged well with me. And part of the reason and why is because the strategic lessons, you know, the case studies on Harley Davidson and, you know, stuff like that about how to build a brand and what it means and what the significance is, it didn't mean as much back then, or at least I didn't think it did when I'm trying to figure out how to find, you know, a hundred bucks here and there to, <laughs> to you know, finance whatever, to, whatever yeah. road trip to New York that I got to go meet somebody on, right? But the strategic lessons have been have been well received, and I and I use them every day. Yeah, I, I've sort of found the same thing with with business school. My first job when I got out of the army was in sales, in the outside sales. It was like sort of this knife fight, fist fight yeah. kind of thing, and I found that what I learned in business school is much the same. Mostly strategic, some operational, not very much tactical. But being in sales taught me some very useful tactical skills. And when I was able to kind of put all those together outside of business school, I found it to be really, really helpful. So I would, I would recommend anybody who's got the stomach for it getting out of the military to consider getting into some sort of sales or outside sales job because it will get you in front of a lot of customers. You'll learn to understand that. And you get this sort of, you get your nose bloodied and you get a lot of that, reps at yeah. learning to close business and learning to promote your products and services. And if you want to start a business, um, you can't get around the sales thing. If you think like, I suck at sales, I don't ever want to do sales, but you want to start a business, like you better, you better have a partner who's at least 50% invested that's really good at it because I might argue that hard. sales is the worst thing to get into because it's such a, a huge gap between what you're comfortable with in the military, which you sell nothing in the military, except you know, you've got to build rapport, which you're always yeah. selling yourself. Check always okay. shows up, supplies uh, always show up. Right. Yeah. So sales being the exact opposite of what I wanted to do with my life. And here I found myself, nobody's, nobody's going to do it for me. I found that out real fast. Nobody's going to do it for you. And so you've got to do it a way that you're comfortable with. And I mean, people weren't calling you on the phone asking if they could buy GR1? <laughs> hey, can, you, you, and, you didn't oh, just can answer pay, inquiries on the website every day? And, and just, can like, I pay $295 for it, please? Right? No, I didn't get too many of those. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but look, you're right. I mean, I think the, the knife fight of sales or whatever it is that gets you out in front of people is, I mean, if you're going to fail, you fail fast. And so failing fast is, is a goal. If you're gonna fail, fail fast because you can recover more quickly that way. Yeah, for sure. So there were a couple of people asked questions about kind of guiding principles. I got one, uh, Jack Salta. Jack, thanks for the question. Um, he asked a, a good question about where did you sort of come up with the guiding principles of GORUCK? And we, you know, around here we talk about things like excellence, mm -hmm. not compromising on quality. We talk about, you know, adaptability, toughness. Th those are things that have been a part of this organization for a long time, and we still talk about every week at least, if not more often. So where did some of that come from? Plus, I know there are other things you care about, like giving back, working with the Green Beret Foundation, et cetera. So where, 
I've seen a, there's a napkin sketch I think on the wall right over there right. actually I should go grab that barf um, bag sketch yeah yeah there's 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 <laughs> literally a napkin sketch that depicts sort of this weird I don't know hierarchy of how Funnel the company up works to create a voice for good yeah, so when when was that drawn and and where did you come up with kind of the guiding principles of the organization right so basically everything that GORUCK represents comes from what I know or what I learned and what I knew from my time in Special Forces. It's a, you're lucky if you get to serve or work in an environment with such a strong culture that is committed to excellence and that is forced to always maintain excellence. Meaning to where it's life and death. And so you have to you have to be excellent every day. And, and the guy to your left and the guy to your right, he's gonna hold you accountable because it's a life and death thing. And you- Isn't that cool? Like actually having to put your best foot forward every single day? You have to, you have to earn it every day. I yeah. mean, the, the easiest day of your time as a Green Beret is your first day. You graduate, you got your, your Green Beret on, you got your special forces tab, you think that you're king of the world and you feel like it and it's awesome, right? Yeah. But that's your easiest day as a Green Beret. You gotta earn your tab every day. And the, and the guys hold you accountable. And so, you know, since the beginning, from the logo to the way that we, that we, that I tackle problems, to the way that the community frowns upon people that whore out their past in special forces, which I was never, ever willing to do, I would rather do anything but that, right? It's, honor and all those things are way too important to me. And so basically all the guiding principles came from special forces. In, as with you know, the guiding principles of GR1, as with you know, what, the, what the Go Ruck Challenge became, as with basically everything that we create, we just leverage our past and frame it in a way that's, that's positive and builds a bridge between the military and the civilian worlds. Yeah, we, I mean, we talk about that, I'm not kidding, at least every week that any new thing that we build whether it's a shirt or a ruck mm -hmm. or any event that we do, we pull it through this lens of what we would call kind of the SF way of life, right? Like we just don't do anything that doesn't adhere to those standards. If it's not tough, if it's not excellent, if it's not mm -hmm. adaptable, then we just don't do it, frankly. And I, I really like that. And then it makes it kind of easy because while it's hard to always adhere to those standards, it's easy to make decisions yeah. around the standards. So I, I would rather have it be clear and easy to make the decisions and then hard put in the hard work to make it you know live up to it yeah and i've seen over the over the years that when you know i wanted to make an exception for this or that because it was not not some compromise of quality or not some just there's always sort of exceptions and then all of a sudden one exception turns into 10 exceptions that are decisions mm -hmm. that other people make yeah. And then you've got a real problem on your hands because your one exception turned into 10. So whether it's pictures on the website or it's you know, some products over, over the years or it's you know, just some stuff like t-shirts or stuff like that. I mean, you, you, one exceptions, one exception, all of a sudden you've got 10 more. And so it, is, it has become really easy to focus on who we are as we increasingly just pass everything, everything through the lens of the Special Forces way of life. It's our roots, it was always our roots. And yeah, you know, sometimes SF guys take their kids to Chuck E. Cheese or something and dress up and it's ridiculous or whatever, right? I mean, that happens, but that's not really the, that's not the norm at all. That's the, that's the outside of, we don't really wanna be in that at yeah, all. You know, even though you can, you can sort of create these exceptions and you can justify these exceptions, we want to take it from the, the really traditional special forces way of life. Yeah, I, I like that. And I, um, I think that a lot of people, I've had a lot of talks with friends of mine. I, you and I are both lucky. We have some pretty, some pretty smart friends. And we talk about people that like run for Congress. And I think that's the dynamic that actually happens with most of those people is like, I think a lot of people go to Washington with good intentions and they're going to kind of change Washington. But guess what? When you get there, it's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's cutthroat. There are all these weird rules you didn't know about. And next thing you know, you're the junior congressman from wherever, and you're making some small little exception because it's for the greater good. And if I just vote for this bill that I don't really believe in, all these other people will vote for my bill, which is going to change the world. And then it just becomes this very slippery slope where the next thing you know, 
you've, you've given up all the principles you really showed up there to do. And I think people do this in businesses too. They, they make these minor exceptions because it's going to be a huge revenue generator mm -hmm. and that's going to support all these other aspects of the business and it's for the greater good. And then the next thing you know, it's a year or two down the line and they're making these decisions just basically based upon the survival yeah. of the business and it's no longer about the principles that you got to go back with, to know? the it, this is that's also the special forces way of life this this happens i mean you think that unconventional implies that you're you're running and gunning shooting between your legs on the move and stuff no to be a good unconventional soldier you've got to be a, an excellent conventional soldier first focus on the fundamentals shoot move communicate then you adapt those fundamentals, the, the, ec the excellence, the expertise that you have, and you can tackle more complex problems. And I just find that the through line between the lessons that we learn in Special Forces to life and business, if you're willing to actually follow those principles, it's pretty straightforward. That's one of the things I like about our business in terms of the way it's set up is that we don't have sort of outside investors or shareholders or whatever. We don't have to compromise. Which is nice because yeah, we don't have to compromise. There's no one lording over us kind of saying like, you need to get 3% more efficient here or you shouldn't pass on this opportunity even though it's a small compromise because it's, it's worth it in the trade-off. Like, we don't have any of those people telling us what to do. We, we have, can't be leveraged because we have no masters and we have no debt. And so unlike your junior congressman who eventually does have someone that he, he or she owes a favor to yep. and, and whatever. Like, we're just not going to do that. And I think we would both agree that we would rather grow 2% a year forever than you know, do anything that's gonna compromise kind of the, the principles that you've laid out um, I mean, I won't for 100% or 200%. I won't, be here, I won't be here to sort of pour out our past. It won't happen. Yeah, I'll, so. I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's. I think you and I are both hypersensitive about like the SF <laughs> yeah. community. Like I, I like have woke, woken up in like cold sweats. Like, what if one of the guys on my team saw Go Ruck and was like, "That's bullshit." Like Blaine's making up a story or embellishing his, you know, combat history or whatever. Like that terrifies me. Yeah. I, there's other than my wife and children leaving me or going away. There's nothing that terrifies me more than one of my former teammates thinking ill of like what I'm doing or, or specifically how I'm leveraging my military experience. That absolutely terrifies me. Yeah, it's identical. All right, let's move on to, to one more here then, then Bomber. I'm, I'm queuing you up. I wanna start taking some that people have sent in. So uh, the last one kind of from the list is um, from Mike, I think it's Mike McDonald. Thanks Mike for the question. He wanted to know where you came up with or why you decided to do the state of Goruck. Mm. So for those of you that haven't read it, Jason sends out at least once a year this sort of open kimono sort of state of Goruck that discusses including in many cases like our financials and things. This is what's going on at Goruck. This is where we screwed up. This is what we're proud of. This is kind of, you know, our revenue, et cetera. What made you want to do that? Or I guess maybe more broadly, what made you want to run the business in a way that is just so transparent? Um, because we've, I've been on the emails. We've gotten some advice after the state of GORUCK goes out yes. from some of our advisors and people that are like, hey, maybe wouldn't put all that stuff out to the public. <laughs> um, and, and, and your response was, meh, we're going to do it anyway. So why? Why do you feel that way about it? So the state of GORUCK was really just, it, it came about organically and naturally. And by that, I mean... There's a closed group called the Go Ruck Tough group, where if you've done a Go Ruck challenge, a light, a tough, a heavy, etc., cetera, then you're, you gain access to this, this Facebook group. And over the years, it's been, you're able to talk about things with them in a way that you know they'll always have your back and you can go, out, go forth and conquer and do whatever. And you can go back to this, this foundation that you have you can get honest feedback if you want it, sometimes if you don't want it, right? But you know that they always, they always love you. But or they what, wouldn't be commenting, right? Right. That's one of those things that I learned in sales, by the way, is that if your customers stop complaining to you, you should be terrified because yep. they're, they're, they're talking to somebody else. Yeah. Same with, same with your wife, by the way. <laughs> so anyway. What are you um, looking at me for? So, so if, if you start saying, okay, so we've got this, this base of people who have passed through our, our events, and now they're on this, this closed group. 
and they just want more information. They just want more, right? And I know for a fact that these are the people that are building GORUCK. This is the classic Special Forces mission, right? You go out, you, you train people up, you get them to believe in the cause, and you set them free. You say, go forth and do awesome things in the name of America, go rock, you know. Do it for yourself, for your community, for the greater good. Yep. And GRTs have answered that call for us. And so there is this page, this group, where it's just always been really open. And people ask me, they tag me all the time. You know, sometimes they want to know how much inventory we've got on something. And I'm kind of getting out of those weeds a little more. That's, that's for you guys, just so you know, right? But more importantly, it's, it's the big stuff. I mean, you want, to keep your, you want to keep your finger on the pulse. And what I realized over time is if you have a one-way conversation, eventually that stops. They want, to know, they want to know what's real, what's really going on, and then they'll do anything for you. They just want to believe in something. And don't we all? You want to believe in something. You want to, you want to listen to a politician at some point tell you what's really going on. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the same, same thing in business. What's really going on here? A human story that's real is greater than something that's perfect pretend, you know? Because nobody's perfect. No company's perfect. No government's perfect. But the more you sort of hide things, the more that people think you're either 200 times the size you are or they think you're a fraction of the size you are. And it's just, look, it is what it is. Here you go. This is what it is. And so, the, the state of GORUP was born of this desire to lead with transparency. And then, you know, it's just kind of, it's disarming. It's one of those lessons I learned in this, this great class that I took in business school on negotiations. It was taught by a FBI hostage negotiator called, uh, named Chris Voss. He's got a book called Never Split the Difference, which is a great read. It sums up the lessons that I learned there that I, I use those lessons every single day. Like English. Do you own that book? Eng I do. Can I borrow it? Yeah. Okay. English. Math and the lessons that I learned in that class, I use them all every single day. And it's very disarming for someone to start a negotiation or a conversation and sort of put their cards on the table and say, yeah. this is where I'm at. People aren't used to that. Negotiations are not all hostile where you just keep your cards as close as you can and hope to extract as much, much as you can. And so I've just seen the growing, the, the customer base of people with the emergence of things like Facebook and Google, and you can find out any information to anything within a couple seconds if you want. And right? share it. And share it. Yeah. And so that's become a, a shift in people's brains and expectations. And so I think that being on the forefront of that, getting out in front of that, is a very modern way to run a business. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that this whole idea of like putting your cars on the table and, and disarming people, it's the same principle really that we talk about with, you know, not having the investors and not being able to be leveraged or compromise on our, our principles. Because if, if you're willing to admit whatever is going on, if there are no skeletons in the closet, if the closet door is wide open or you just take, the, take it off the hinges altogether, then you can't be compromised. You can't be leveraged. You're in a position of honesty, if not strength, because you're willing to say, like, look, this is who I am. This is who we are. This is who good, I am. For this, good or bad. Yeah, you know? this is like, who we'll I am. This is what least. I did. You know, you can say that about your time in SF. I can say that about my time in SF. And there's a bunch of guys who were there too. Yeah. And, and if, if all of a sudden we decided to create some fiction or some other, you've seen it before, the guy that embellishes his past, and then all of a sudden it comes out and it's this huge scandal. Yeah, it's like short-term, great, and then yeah. long-term, not No so thanks. Great. Yeah, because the, the truth shall set you free. It does. It does. All right. Bomber, what do you got for us? Any questions over there? Uh, yeah, Andrew wants to know if you can explain the service action element, the thoughts behind that. expectations. Got it. So just to repeat the question, Andrew wants to know if we can explain the service action component. And so for those of you that don't know, uh, earlier this year, Jason put out sort of a, I don't know, a decree. What's that's a terrible word. That's not a good word. Jason put out some guidance <laughs> yeah. to the GORUCK community and the cadre, basically saying that every challenge kind of light, tough, heavy, will have some sort of service action uh, associated with it. So not a community service project, but just some small thing for all of our 900 or so uh, go around challenges going on out there to do something for the community, whether it's pick up trash, deliver canned goods to a homeless shelter, etc. Um, 
small things add up. That's sort of my, my take on it. W what was your thought process behind that and like how, how's that going? So when I f the first day I showed up and I got counseled in a, a 10th group, there was a thing at the top that said, those to whom much is given, much is expected. And I, that really stuck with me. Obviously, I'm still talking about it, you know, what, a long time later, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, since, oh, that was in 06. Is that a Star Wars thing, Andy? With great, no, it's a, it's a Spider-Man thing. With great power comes great responsibility. That's a Spider-Man thing. So that's actually what Sorry, Emily nerds. told I don't me. Really know. That's, that was in a note from Emily once I became a Green Beret. She's, anyway, sort of crossing, crossing wires there. But so the, the, thought, the thought process being that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of events that are out there and there's a lot of, you know, hey, we encourage you to raise money and, and then we take all the credit for it and stuff like that. We see that a lot, right? There's, there's all sorts of ways that people do that stuff and that's great. Go raise money for great causes, not against it for the record. But the goal with the service actions was to say that doing is, doing is a really important thing. If, you've, if you have kids, you, know, you don't want to teach them that all you do is write a check and you show them the check that you donate and then, oh, I donated, you know, 200 bucks to the American Red Cross or whatever. Hey, you know, Johnny, look at this. Look, this is what giving back looks like. No, I think you need to get out and do stuff. And so we just wanted to go back to our roots again, which, you know, civil affairs projects and those types of things are very much integrated into the mission set of special forces where you have to go into local communities. You have to build rapport. Sometimes that, that means you've got to Take your pick, right? You've got to dig to go ditches. Go to cadre out there and know exactly what we're yes. talking about. There's been a lot of rapport building with local cops and people that show up. Like, what the heck are you guys <laughs> doing around here? Like, Wait, so yeah. the roots, though, are you know wartime service, civil affairs projects, and you do things for the community. It makes the community a better place. And so we would we would call upon everyone out there to say, you know, are you unhappy about your local politicians? Are you unhappy about your national politicians? Or do you wish they were doing better? And the first things that, that we can do is look at, say, hey, what can we control? What can we actually control? Before we just, you know, get angry and watch whatever your preferred news station is at night and you just None sit there and you're just yeah. sort of pounding the table all night, what, what can you actually do to make the world a better place, make our country a better place? And that starts with the community where you live. It starts with the people that you love that are closest to you. It starts with then your circle of friends. If you can organize things, then that, that matters. And so the service action at the challenge, beyond just what we've seen, we've seen people clean grave sites, we've brought, you know, we, we, we've brought supplies to orphanages and to, you know, shelter for women with, with young kids and, and, and all those things. But the real goal was to inspire something inside of someone that says, that feels really good, I wanna go do more of that. I wanna take the lessons of the challenge and apply them even more to my daily life. Yeah, I mean, we have this really amazing platform that is GORUCK and we have this amazing community of people out there that are doing the GORUCK challenge and, and are part of it. And why not take 900 opportunities a year or whatever it is to do at least one small thing in a community that, you know, you can, you can build a mountain out of gravel, it's hard, but you can certainly do it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. early on I got a note from one guy. It's like, what if I don't want to do it, right? It was still kind of not understood, it wasn't adopted, it was probably just a what if question. I said, not a problem. Just show up for the challenge, and when you get to the service action component, just tell the cadre that you would like to do something else. You'd like to opt for what's yeah. behind door number two. You'd like to opt for door number two. And, and you know, that, that would not be a problem for the cadre. He would definitely find something for you to do. If you, all you wanted was the, the, the physical component, he can help you with that. <laughs> I believe in the cadre. They, they, will, they will make they that They are happen. empowered to make <laughs> they decisions are empowered. with autonomy. <laughs> Bomber, what else you got? Marcus wants to know, will there be more events in Europe? Marcus wants mm -hmm. to know if there'll be more events in Europe. We had a good conversation about Normandy the other day. It didn't really, it wasn't really about European expansion. So what's, what's your answer? Europe. Uh, so we love this, you, Europe. thank you for not providing a timeline to that question of will there be more events. So he, here's the fundamental difference between Europe and the United States is that this sort of grounded in United States special forces theme and ethos and just core to who we are and what we do, it plays really, really well in America. And so our focus has certainly been, let's 
focus on America and getting that message out and laying a really solid foundation here and then figuring out how we move into Europe on probably a different message. I mean, obviously we also sell gear, it's great. Europeans would love it and several of them do. And as we get more involved with rucking specifically, so putting a little bit of weight in a backpack and going for a walk, you know, there's a fitness component to that that is a lot more universal. So the short answer is, is that almost all of our cadre live in America. So to fly them over to Europe, it gets really costly, time, you know, time intensive, and it, it's difficult. And we don't have the same base of people that want to show up for the event. So we don't run as many. I think it's more of a holistic approach that eventually once we say, okay, Europe can and should be a real thing, a real market. And by the way, Japan is also another one. Mm -hmm. And we say this is, this is a viable place in a the market. Then we have to figure out what gear distribution looks like. And then we have to figure out what kind of marketing looks like. And in marketing, I'll lump events as well. Because in you know, the the translation or the outcome of the events rather is that it's a marketing platform and people find out about it. They gotta, you know, they gotta go through a lot and then they become raving fans, but it's just, it's a different, it's a different environment. So yeah. there will be more. We would love for there to be more, you know, demand has to dictate how many and when. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I've talked with a lot of people even in the UK and in like Australia, where we, I think sometimes in the States we assume they're like, they're like just like us because they speak English, which is not actually true in terms of culture. And even working in, in the veteran space previously, this idea of like, not that they're not patriotic, but the idea that we like flags up front, the American flag in front of the challenge class. Um, and the way we celebrate veterans here in the United States, it's just not really that way mm -hmm. a lot of places. And so to, to translate our culture and, some, and our values not impossible. There's, it's not like there's no overlap, but it's definitely not an easy kind of one-for-one -one translation to any other country, even the ones that we like would consider to be most similar to us. So there's some work to be done. The other, the other thing is our gear is, is pretty expensive, partially because it's made in the USA and it's like special forces great stuff. You know, that's maybe not so important to people in other countries that the gear is made in the USA. I don't, I don't know, maybe it is, but there, there's I mean, some more work to be done there. I mean, GR1, do you want it to cost 400 euros? I mean, that's reasonably what it's going to cost if we just export it to you. And so, you know, I mean, are there other ways to do it? Yeah, there are. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a more strategic look at how we do it correctly because the problem is, is if you do it just a little bit, it just starts to suck the life out of you from a time standpoint. And so, We've kind of said, hey, the best shipping option is DHL. It's really expensive, but it guarantees that it's going to get there. We're going to do that. The, you know, it's, it's that, it just more cost on top of it. It becomes prohibitive, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't suck the life out of us in terms of the time that we have to spend to sort of you know, work us a, a bad system and make it a little bit yeah. better. So we'd rather just kind of pick a pick a target date, which we haven't done and aren't close to doing. We're not, we're not promising anything. To anyone. And, and say, this is, this is what it looks like. But it, it's got to have a gear distribution center. So if you start hearing rumblings or when, when that starts, we'll sort of start saying, hey, this is what gear distribution looks like, which, oh, by the way, was complicated by Brexit because presumably the biggest market over there would be the UK, right? London. And now that's potentially a completely different distribution chain with different taxes we don't know we're you know we're just americans people come on right and so we don't know how that's going to work for for europe yeah. and so then it's so where should the distribution center be should it be in the uk should it be in say the netherlands you know that type of stuff i mean we just don't know so all these types of these these complexities these unknowns it's just we're punting yeah so we, we will figure it out eventually i'm, I'm completely convinced but a lot of and there are actually several questions in the facebook group about um, different event series in Europe and Asia and things. And these all kind of fall into a category that I would describe as opportunity management, which is a high quality problem. Like if, you're, if your business and your organization is doing well enough that you've got a lot of different opportunities, that's, that's pretty good. Like mm -hmm. I'm cool with that. But we have to be disciplined in terms of what opportunities we spend our time and effort on because we want to be efficient and effective with what we're doing. And so we don't want to disproportionately spend time on things yeah. that yield a 
a relatively low kind of return on our time and our energy because we want to do the best we can along the lines that are most appropriate for not us just, right now. Not just so. money, but time and energy. Oh, more that, more so time and energy. Yeah, that's, say, yeah. The, that's the most valuable resource we have. So yeah. it's, unfortunately, you get better at saying no. Fortunately, you get better at saying no. It's, it's a double-edged sword. But ultimately, if you want to build a great business and continue to make the lasting impact that we have you know, these almost 10 years on the people that we're grateful for, then we've got to get got to get really good at saying no to things or yes if and then you start to plan around what that if looks like. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's even true kind of in your personal life, right? I mean, if you're lucky enough, if you're fortunate enough to have opportunities to be involved in things or get invited to things or people want to come, you know, you want to talk at a conference or love life business war, there's always sort of Yeah, the people same. want you to be on the board of their nonprofit or whatever. Like if if you're if you're blessed enough, if you've done well enough to where You've got that going on. A, you should be thankful and be very gracious. And give some time back yeah, to whatever that sure. looks like. But B, if you want to be good at, at what you're doing and you want your families to still be a priority in your life, like you've got to, at some point, learn to have some discipline and, and manage your opportunities and, and say no gracefully um, whenever you can. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. We should all be so lucky to be, to be in that position, like you are, Mr. You Podcast. Are. Bob, we got one more, man. What's up? Yeah, Ryan wants to know, was Go Ruck the original brand name? What's the last name on Ryan? I need to know if Harmon. it's... Ryan Harmon. Okay. Ryan Harmon wants to know, what was the original brand name for Go Ruck? Was, was Go Ruck the original brand name? Was it the original brand name, Jason? Yes, Go Ruck was the original brand name. Easy. We got, okay. Then we can do one more. That was fast. Uh, is there a four-beer limit from Catherine? A four-beer limit from Catherine... What on... Can you exp for expand... For y'all? Oh, for us. For each, I'll get four. Is that the limit? No, because there's a whole fridge that's full of beer. So if we want more beer after we're done with our four, then you know we just move on to the rest of the refrigerator. Yeah. And then when the refrigerator empties up, there's a whole grocery store and a whole, you know, what is it, gas station right there. Gas stations are easier for buying beer. That's my take, right? Life hack, buy beer at the gas station. Yeah, especially if you buy domestic beer. Because like yeah, Budweiser, easy. Bud Light is basically the same price at the gas I mean, station. As I mean, the these store. problems, you go to the, how much time do you waste in life? You show up and... It's like, which pinky out beer am I going to buy today, right? And like you look at this I've seat, been there. I've it's been like, the beer It's like in Hurt like... Locker, right? When he's trying to figure out how the cereal, <laughs> right? That's like me going to the beer aisle. And it's just, no, just make life easier. Just pick your horse and just go with that horse. Budweiser, whatever, right? There's lots of, there's lots of versions like that. But every, every time you go, these philosophical debates in your head about you know, how far out do I want to stick my pinky while I drink this, you know, beer? And some of the beers aren't even beers, they're wine coolers, right? Because any beer infused with a fruit is a wine cooler. That's a fact. I don't think that's a fact. but It's I'll... a fact. It's a man fact. Okay, so Catherine, <laughs> to answer your question, I've, I've been here uh, a while, and I've been here several times before that, and there's, there's never not been Budweiser in, in the fridge. I'm sure there's been a stock out at some point in the history of Goruck, but not in my experience. So um, there isn't a beer limit. I think we're, we're pretty responsible. We both have to like go home and cook dinner and, and be dads after this. So we're not a uh, caveman. No, by the way, you, you got to wake up in the morning and do it all over again. Yeah, so, you know, for sure. I got kids and tomorrow's a work day. That's been my life for years now, right? And before it used to be in the early days, it was I would stay up until all hours of the night, three, four in the morning, you know, on these sort of, Go Ruck Tough groups and doing research on this and that. And then, you know, sleep until kind of when I woke up, wake up and do it all over again. So, I don't know, I guess we're maturing or something. Cause, oh, this is uh, this, this ties right back into the SF way of life, which is that big boy rules apply. And so, you know, if you work here and you're, and you're part of this, there's essentially an unlimited number of Budweiser's in the refrigerator. However, the expectation is you conduct yourself accordingly. Yeah, tell the story you, about the you time you went, you went out with your team the night before and what did you guys do in the morning? Oh yeah, so one time... Uh, SF Way of Life 101 yeah, right so here. So no shit, there I was this one time. Um, we were away from the flagpole at another installation doing some training and we, we had a very strict rule that was like, you know, there's certainly the eight hour bottle to throttle rule, which means you don't touch a firearm or a vehicle until at least eight hours after the last time you, you touch uh, an alcoholic beverage which should go without saying at any team out there. But we, my team was big on doing PT and uh, making sure that we were fit. Um, and so we had a range that was later in the morning. 
but PT was a couple hours before that. And so, you know, I, I called it at the bar at whatever it was, midnight. We were reasonably responsible, but most of us got up the next morning at six, not feeling a hundred percent. We'll just say that. And there's kind of some grum, we're in like a bay, yeah. you know, kind of, kind of living in this tin can of a, of a barracks thing. And there's some groaning and, and grunting and stuff. And the, an- the only answer was, <laughs> we plan to run six miles this morning. Every one of you mofos is gonna run six miles. Yeah. You don't have to run it fast, but every single one of you is gonna run it. And so if, if it hurts, it's on you. It's a self-inflicted wound. Big boy rules apply here. And so That's how you cram two time. lives into one though, right? You cram two lives into one. You do stuff like that, it's awesome. It's the special forces way of life. And yeah, I think we're, you feeling good about this? Yeah, absolutely. Was there anything urgent out there? I saw you uh, holding yeah, up two a... Questions. Right, two Palmer, questions. All right, Palmer, we're going we're gonna to allow one more. Just, this seems just like a you. yes, no, or no comment. Is it true that y'all keep hiring Marines just to feel safe around like you? <laughs> I'm not even going to dignify that question with a response. What else you got, Palmer? Yeah, tiger stripe. There's a lot of chatter about that. <laughs> a lot of tiger stripe. There's some guy that owns the rights to it. We've actually looked at it. It's like if a you, licensing situation. It's a licensing order, thing. Yeah. If you think that we are going to just make tiger stripe stuff, put it on our website, and then you're going to buy it, you are sadly mistaken. I don't think anyone's actually going to buy it. So what we're going to do it's like is we're going to do... It's a Wednesday tough group thing. It's a <laughs> Wednesday tough group thing. Everybody wants tiger stripe because it's the forbidden fruit, right? Well, we're going to come up with it. We're going to do it in GR1 at some point, if we can figure out this, this wizard with the licensing <laughs> rights to it. And for, for those that don't know, Tiger Stripe is a, mil, a, it's a Vietnam era camouflage pattern. It's pretty cool. I like it. It's kind of like the BDU woodland pattern a little bit with a little bit more, you know. A little black in it. A little black in it. More some sort of daggers and stuff a little bit more style camo. Anyway, and we're going to do a pre-sale and we'll see how you do. If you guys do great, then we'll make it. If you don't, then we'll probably never listen to any of your suggestions ever again. <laughs> That's perfect. What else, Palmer? Come on. Jason, advice for GRT entrepreneurs. So advice for GRT entrepreneurs. So my first advice to entrepreneurs is make a list of a thousand excuses or reasons why it's going to be hard. And if, if you can stomach all of them, then maybe then and only then should you consider doing this, right? And so ex- reasons why it's gonna be hard are, you know, I've gotta be home every night at six for dinner. I've gotta, you know, take my kids to school in the morning. I've gotta, you know, show up for family vacations. I've got like, like, deployments. I can't give up my study paycheck. I can, yeah, I can't give up I've my study. I've got a Mercedes and a 3,000 square foot home. Yeah, I mean, can you, can you budget $20,000 a year for five years? On, like, can you do that? $30,000, depends on wh- what you wanna do. I mean, I will say almost a decade later that I have, since I first had a bank account in college from some teaching tennis or something that I did over the summer, that I've never had less money in my bank account than I do right now. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you're in it for sort of the glory and the autonomy and the whatever reasons, that's the wrong answer. The right answer is find something that you're really passionate about and do more of that. If that forces you into entrepreneurship, then, then and only then go forth, conquer, and do awesome. All right. We are going to leave it at that. I think that's been a good, a good background. We had... I get to several of the questions, not all of them, some long answers, which I think is was appropriate. So I've had fun. Thanks for doing this, man. Awesome. All right, we will be back uh, next week, I guess. Next I think week. We're doing this every week now. This is three weeks in a row. Yeah, the Go Ruck Show. The Go Ruck Show. All right, we'll see you guys in a week. Thanks for tuning in.